Our first guest is Steve Williams, mayor of the city of Huntington, and now, as we know, a Democratic candidate for governor in the state of West Virginia. Steve, good morning to you. Good morning, gents. Good to be with you this morning. Thanks for having me on. Great to have I you. Just up in, I was just up in your neck of the woods uh, over the weekend on Friday and Saturday. There were a couple of events, and uh, uh, it was fun to be up there. Now, Saturday got to be a little bit mm-hmm. fun because it was because of the rain and everything. But uh, Berkeley County Democrats and Jefferson County Democrats each had events on Friday and Saturday, and uh, it was fun to be able to be up there. But you mentioned the weather, Steve. Uh, I don't. Uh, I've been watching. I guess most everybody else has as well on the Weather Channel radar, and I am amazed how these major fronts pop up and break up so quickly. We in northern part of Martinsburg were, for the most part, in a shadow uh, compared to what other were uh, just to the west of us and to some degree to the east of us. Major, major sales, and yet we we miss the bulk of it. We've we've had a lot of difficulty with with that in the last two three years in, in Huntington. Micro storms just showing up. There was one, I think it was two years ago. Uh, micro storm came over right in the downtown area and had five inches of rain in 30 minutes. Wow. If you can imagine. And uh, no matter what kind of a stormwater system that you might have, and sadly, in one of the areas where it, it hit, we didn't have a storm water system. And uh, um, flooding uh, started uh, occurring. And uh, that's why it's important for us to be constantly building our infrastructure which we haven't been able to do over the decades but now we do have that capacity does that include uh, uh water rescue capability steve yes um the, the, it, it's complex but uh, you have ems uh, we have our, our fire department and uh uh all of that fits under Homeland Security. Fortunately, our fire chief was the deputy secretary of Homeland Security for Southern West Virginia, so he has connections everywhere. What what was so, what I was so fearful about uh, two years ago, is that uh, I can't remember which hurricane was making its way through, but the day before it was supposed to come in, um, we have a flood wall around Huntington that was built back in 19 in the late 1930s and uh, what I was most fearful of is that if our pumps go out then we are just hosed Uh, there would be a major part of Huntington would have been under underwater if we were trying to find a huge um, generator to be a backup just in case fortunately unfortunately we weren't able to find one fortunately it didn't hit us Mm -hmm. head on um, and we have now acquired a big generator, and it's the size of a uh, uh, a coal uh, coal car, and uh, it's just humongous. And it's amazing as you start to look at all of the integration of the different departments. Uh, it's not just it, it's not just uh, first responders. It takes public works and everybody else. Uh, it takes the entire community to be able to come together. Steve, let's talk about this decision to run for governor. Obviously, you've been uh, kicking the tires on this one for a while before <laughs> you finally decided to go uh, completely public with it. Now we know uh, January still <laughs> off, of course, for official filing or whatever. But uh, if you decided to kind of go all in on this, tell me about the process of getting there. Well, and, and interestingly, Rob, I mean, you all have followed it from the very beginning, where I was, or very early in the process, where I was saying, I'm leaning, I'm pretty sure I'm going, mm-hmm. and leaning so far that I'm practically falling over. <laughs> um, the process hasn't uh, actually been completed yet. I have to file my pre candidacy papers, and I'm going to do that in October because mm-hmm. I'm not going to file. Here and have only about three weeks of activity to be able to show, and then the headlines will be Williams raises five, raises five dollars. <laughs> 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 you know, so I want to make sure that when we 
<laughs> once once we hit October one, is that I've got a bunch of fundraisers set up and have an, a mechanism for uh, small donors to be able to make their their donations. But the reality is, um, is as we know, Ben Salango was trying to make a decision. Um, everything that I'm looking at, and, and I'm grateful and really pleased that uh, I'm not going to have to go up against Ben. Um, very well might have to go up against someone but I've been traveling around the state right now just as I've indicated I've been up a few times in uh, your neck of the woods mm -hmm. um, and this week I'm going to be over in Wharton and in other areas mostly right now I'm wanting to listen but what I'm finding is that the concerns that folks are talking about are the very things that we've had to deal with much on a much smaller scale, but very directly, and it's had a, a, a massive effect on, it could have be either been unbelievably negative, they could have thrown us into bankruptcy, or positive, where we start to find a pathway out, and fortunately we've done that, and I think that's something, and it's necessary for me, at the very least, at the very least, to be in the campaign, to be able to uh, tell our story in let folks know there there are alternatives as to how we might be able to approach governing over the next four years. Uh, a year ago at this time, when the state was running some pretty huge surpluses, it would have been difficult, I think, to make a case that the state wasn't doing well financially. However, since those surpluses are much lower, some of that, of course, is expected with the income tax cut. Uh, there are more folks who are now beginning to publish polls that there's not as much confidence in the state's economy. Uh, you have other uh, uh, groups that are claiming that the uh, the state has to be very careful now in terms of financial footing because of these uh, surpluses that have uh, been dramatically reduced uh, as time has continued along in this new budget year. Steve, so do you find that uh, there's a bit more vulnerability in the Republican Party now than there might have been a year ago in, in terms of how the, the state's taxpayers and citizens are, are viewing it? I think we're vulnerable as a state. I'm not so sure that the Republican Party is vulnerable, nor do they even think that they're vulnerable, and that's, that's understandable given... Uh, their position right now in in the body politic with, with within the state within the state but my, my concern is is that the surplus was because there's so much more money that came in through the cares act so much money came in through rescue plan and others that's one-time money and I was dealing with much the, the, the same thing. Fortunately, what we were doing in, in Huntington is that we structured some things early on so that when we came through COVID that we didn't have to make, make use of the CARES Act, make use of all of the other rescue plan money. Um, we didn't have to balance our budget with, with those. We already had our budget balanced. And when you have one-time money, you need to have one-time expenses. That's where you put money in, into infrastructure. My concern is is that coming in with the massive tax cut, frankly, I agree that if we have the, the capacity, we should be doing what everything that we can uh, to be able to reduce taxes. And frankly, I don't object with reducing or eliminating the, the income tax. What I do object to is uh, not doing it or doing it in such a way that you can't actually see uh, a, a path forward. I eliminated the business and occupation tax on manufacturing, eliminated the business occupation tax on retailers. We cut our business and occupation tax on service businesses. What we did is we we set it up as where we would just make sure we did a during COVID uh, we did it temporarily um, just to suspend it to be able to help our businesses make our way through COVID and all of a sudden we found actually our revenues increased. Now I know 
I'm beginning to sound very Reagan esque in in, mm-hmm. in 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 this in this regard. But it worked for for us. My concern is, and I'm not saying that uh, the governor or the legislature made mistakes, but I do have a very conservative perspective when it comes to fiscal matters. You don't go jumping out unless you know that you have an area where you can actually land. And I'm I'm fearful that uh, in the eagerness to begin reducing uh, the or eliminating the uh, personal income tax, there's not a soft landing area sitting out there where you know that you have the ability to be able to to replace that. Uh, it, it could very well be that it's being structured in such a way to force the uh, downsizing of, of, of government, and when I consider some of our infrastructure problems, um, I'm in higher education problems and, and such. I'm, I'm concerned that uh, in our haste to eliminate the taxes and to reduce the size of government, that we're leaving ourselves uh, somewhat exposed. And frankly, that could leave us very vulnerable over the next four to five years. Yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, are there specific areas that you feel that the state is vulnerable just now? You you've made the argument that uh, uh, that with the reduction in income tax uh, and the flatline budget, uh, that certain needs are, are probably not being met. Uh, unintended consequences. Would you be more specific? What some of these might be? Well, very, very specifically, I am concerned when I look at what's happening at, at WVU. Um, this isn't something that's just happened in the last couple of years or it's effect, being uh, having a cause and effect of the, uh, the plan to eliminate uh, the, the personal income tax. But over the recent years, um, there has been an ongoing – Effort to switch the, uh, the the burden of how higher education is going to be paid for, and as a result, what we have seen, and this isn't just in West Virginia, this is nationally, um, but West Virginia also has in its responsibility to to be able to properly fund our higher education system, is that the way the, the way the colleges and universities were forced to address this was by increasing tuition and 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 frankly now i'm i'm lucky because i went to school on on an athletic scholarship so i didn't have to i didn't have to take on that debt but back during that day uh tuitions weren't so uh, terribly high but frankly it's become the privatization of public public higher education and uh, that is an area of concern. I'm also concerned on our infrastructure efforts, with infrastructure being absolutely necessary. There are parts of West Virginia, rural areas of West Virginia, that don't have running water. Now, uh, that in the in the most powerful and in, in the richest nation on, on earth, that absolutely cannot cannot be. We have churches that go uh, on, on church missions into other countries, third world countries, and build water systems when we also – and I'm not, not criticizing that, but just saying third world areas don't have water, and we have our, our – our, uh, faith community reaching out to, to them to be able to to build adequate water systems, and we have that right in our backyard, right here. My my biggest concern is is that when I look at education, higher education very specifically, when I look also over in the Eastern Panhandle, is that uh, how we've not been able to be able to address this. Um, is that there is a market differential. It's a lot more expensive to live in the eastern panhandle than it is down in the very southern part of the state. And as a result of that, teachers can go over into Maryland, can go over into Virginia and be able to get uh, a 
a, a large um, boost in, in compensation versus West Virginia. We have to be able to structure ourselves so that we can have a market differential to be able to compete in, in that regard. All, it's the same way with police um, and, and uh, first responders to be able to do that. So I see, once again, some areas where this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. These are these are things that we're dealing with on a on a daily basis, um, regardless of which party is 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 in power. But the reality is is that in order to govern, you have to be able to state very clearly, very clearly, this is this is a priority that we must address. I found that to be the case when I was in in the city and. And when I became mayor here, just trying to lift the compensation level of, of, of police, um, it took us a while. But now our police, out, notwithstanding the Eastern Panhandle, our police are now being funded. At, uh, we have the highest paid police force in, in the state of, of West Virginia. And it, once again, it's a matter of identifying the issue, owning it. And not just the governor, but the governor has to set the, the standard. This is what we will be doing. And then you start leading in that direction. Steve, does the governor have the power, the executive power, to just simply invoke higher pay for a region of the state? You know, that's something I'm looking into. One thing that I've found that, that I've done, certainly you have to get, you have to get an appropriation. Um, but there's some areas start to look to see, all right, where does the power rest? Um, if there's ever even a question mark as to whether there is the, the chief executive has the authority to be able to do something, I'm willing to push the envelope and just say, all right, then stop me. Uh, the way I figure it is that uh, you start moving down that path, you identify, I've always said to my attorneys, uh, let me have the full width of the field that we're going to be using. And for that matter, I want to know where the boundaries are, and we'll go right up to the, to the line and lean over if necessary. Because what we need to do is that the governor has to govern. The key, the key is, and understand, let's understand this, uh, there is only one governor. There's 134 members of the legislature albeit in the House and in the Senate, there are a, a few who actually lead the charge, but still there's one governor, and even if it's five senators and five to ten uh, House members, delegates, uh, that's 15 people, but still there's one governor, and the governor has to set the standard and identify, or identify the vision, articulate the vision, build consensus around the vision, and then act. Steve, uh, are you satisfied with the progress that's been made on the correctional front and also DHHR in the past year? No. Um, Secretary Sandy is a, uh, is, a, is a close associate of mine, and we've worked well together. Um, but the fact of the matter is it feels to me that this is something that's just sitting there saying, well, we have to address, and it, had, it has not had a, um, a, a head-on, um, what's the way that I want to say it, addressing it head-on and taking, once again, taking the bull by the horns and acting on it. Secretary Sandy uh, has indicated uh, the plans that they're trying to put in place to, to make sure that they're addressing these, but the reality is is that our, the corrections officers are underfunded. They're, they are in being underfunded. They're not being paid appropriately, even though they just recently got a raise. It's still below uh, the standard that would necessarily set a long-term path to, uh, to, to, to solving the problem. But they're horribly understaffed. And then when we start to, to look at the problems of uh, foster care and such through DHHR, uh, once again, that's an ongoing problem. <laughs> my, my, certainly, 
one of the things, one of the best way to be able to bring ourselves out of this is to create prosperity in 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 the state and to create jobs. And one job starts to solve an awful lot of problems uh, that, that that we have. But the reality is, at the same time, while you're creating jobs, creating economic opportunity, and creating some prosperity, there is also uh, a bit of a lag, that uh, a lag time, that when that happens, then eventually five to seven years, others start li- being lifted up. Well, those five to seven years, they're children that are being adversely affected. You have seniors who are being adversely affected, and that's where you have to have a very aggressive um, program um, in in public safety as well as uh, in uh, uh, DHHR. But the reality is all of these things that I'm talking about, I can just hear others saying, well, Lord, he's going to, he's going to be spending himself uh, uh, beyond what we have ever, ever had in, in surpluses. No, I'm going to make blessed sure that we stay within, within the budget, but every step along the way, every, it is such a complex organization and organism that we're dealing with when we're talking about the state's economy is that what we have to do is everything has to has to be taken in such a way that you are building for the future and you are taking a step where some others might not ever ever even see what you're what you're seeing but the reality is is you're trying to create economic opportunity create the revenue to be able to take care of those who are marginalized and you do it in such a way that uh, you you never overspend yourself and you can't spend yourself into prosperity but you certainly can make sure that you're watching every every dollar what i what i found when i was in in huntington is that we had pensions that were underfunded. We we had health care that was underfunded. Uh, we had salaries that were were lower um, and all of these. And everybody was saying, well, you, you need to lift the compensation level of our first responders. Uh, we need to protect our, our, our hospitalization. What are you doing to save our – our, our our pensions were very very carefully. We knew where we needed to go, and there were some that were cussing me all along the way. But right now they're praising us because they started to see there was a path that we were following. We tried to articulate that to, to individuals, but if you've never seen it before, you're not going to recognize it. The reality is is that we are in a different time and a different challenge uh, in. In the way government is is structured right now, and you have to have somebody who has a vision, as I said earlier, has a vision, is able to articulate the vision, and be able to build consensus around it, and then actually act on it. You have to have a plan. You understand that, Admiral. You have to have a plan, and you have to set that plan forward and be doggedly determined that this is how we're going to be moving forward. Steve, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning and your appearance on our show. Wish you the best of luck as you seek to get those $5 donations you were talking about <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> Come up. There's a lot of $5 yeah. in each pan. I'll come yeah. back, Steve. Hey, Bill, you can do $5. <laughs> I can do 5 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> on October 1st, it's going to go up to $50. <laughs> hey, Steve, best of luck to you. It's always a pleasure Thanks. speaking with you. Okay. Thanks. I've enjoyed it, fellas. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Have a great day. Bye. That's 